You have got to stop worrying about your form when you're playing practice rounds or, or especially if you're playing in a tournament. Thinking about your form is just going to mess you up. It's going to ruin your score and it's going to take your focus and attention away from what really matters and that's holistically playing well. Hey everybody, what is up? It's Antonio. Welcome to episode 15 of Teach Play Disc Golf, a Gladiator Disc Golf podcast. I am so excited for today's episode. I cannot wait to share a lot of the different things that we're going to be talking about. So here's the basically the outline for the show. We're going to talk about this idea of when to think about your form. This is something that I've been asking around and I've been working on. And I wanted to share those same concepts with you because when I was asking those questions, I had a lot of people comment on some of the the threads that I posted. And basically, they were like, I'm just commenting because I want to get updates because I'm dealing with the same thing. So we're going to talk a good bit about that and some of the things that I've learned. We're gonna have a disc review today. I'm super excited. We're gonna be looking at the MVP Tesla. Then we're gonna go over some of the current events, Kristen Tatar, Disc Golf Bra versus PVGA, um, and a couple things with that. We're gonna talk about a disc golf basket, just the basket in general, what is going on, what maybe needs to be done. And if you uh, watch the Portland Open, you kind of know what I'm getting at here. Then we're going to recap the Portland Open, and then we will preview the Zootown Open, which is a Disc Golf Pro Tour Silver Series. We're going to preview that. That's in Missoula, Montana. I have a lot of thoughts about that tournament, and I cannot wait to share them with you. But that is the uh, that is the show for today, so let's go ahead and let's get right into it. One of the things that I have struggled with is turning off my brain when it comes to my form. You see, for the last three years, basically, I have been working on my backhand, refining it, practicing new things, trying new stuff, and just overall developing my backhand. And it's taken a lot of time. It has not come naturally to me whatsoever. I have zero baseball experience. I've never played tennis. Uh, I've never pitched like I've played wiffle ball and I've played a few games like three games of backyard baseball but I grew up playing basketball and playing football and even the football was backyard football basketball was mainly street ball and a few years of organized ball so I don't have the uh, the baseball experience that would have naturally translated into something like disc golf. So for me, the backhand has just been such a difficult thing to kind of improve and get better at. And that's why it's taken me three years, because on top of that, just trying to improve my craft and my game, I've been running this channel. (laughs) So, you know, I've had a lot of things going on, working full time, running this channel, all that stuff. So fast forward now three years from when I first started, and I basically realized that, hey, my backhand is in a really good spot right now. Like there's always going to be things that I want to improve upon. I'm not saying that I don't want to keep improving, but I will say that I'm at a spot where I'm really happy with it and I'm just going to continue working on it uh, progressively like every disc golfer does, always fine tuning things. But what I've noticed is that when I go to play a round, just a casual round for fun, but I'm just going to play, I'm not necessarily working on one specific thing, I realize that I can't help but work on my form. That I have become so ingrained with basically saying, okay, um, I'm coming here, I'm just going to have fun, but every time I get up, get on the tee or I'm somewhere in the fairway, I'm like, okay, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. And instead of just throwing the disc, I'm overthinking every single aspect of the throw, trying to make sure that I continue to do it perfectly or up to the standard that I've been doing it. And it's it's not that I haven't been scoring as well, you know, in the past than I was when I was thinking about, it, but I'm just trying to go and basically have fun. I'm not trying to work on something. 
And so, you know, if you're like me and you've been having this issue, I, I'm sorry that you're having this issue as well. And I can't wait to help you with it. But I want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to know that there's a lot of disc golfers out there who have this uh, struggle. You know, it's easy to look at the pros and be like, man, they do it so effortlessly. But a lot of them playing for years, if not decades, and they've just gotten to the point where they don't have to think about it anymore. But there's this period where we have to think about it and work on it. And this period where we don't have to think about it and work on it. And the hard thing is bridging those two areas. How do we get from thinking about it every time to not thinking about it? So I have it kind of basically split into two things here. So during a round, the only time that you should think about your form when you've reached the point where, hey, I'm happy with my form or, hey, I don't really want to work on anything today. I just want to go and have fun is only if you're working on a specific skill on every hole and every throw. And so obviously, if you're not wanting to work on anything, you obviously wouldn't do this. But if you're saying, hey, I'm having a hard time separating, you know, I do feel work. And then I also go to the course and work on things. That's the position that I'm in. I've worked on my form in both places. So I naturally have connected the two and I haven't been able to separate them. Well, one of the things that helps is during the round, if I say, hey, I'm actually going to work on something, I'm picking one, maybe two specific skills that I'm focusing on with the backhand. I'm not worrying about anything else, but though that one or two things. And that is what I focus on every hole and every backhand throw or forehand throw, whatever the skill is you're working on. The other thing that helps, and I've done this a lot more uh, recently, basically since I've been able to play a lot more this year, is I will play around and not keep score. Sure, mentally I'm like, Ooh, that was a birdie. Oh, like, ooh, that wasn't a birdie, or yes, that was a birdie, that kind of thing. But I have played a lot of rounds this year where I just haven't kept score. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. I think that's honestly good because keeping score can be so distracting. Like, hey, you're working on something, so you know you're going to make mistakes, but yet we still expect ourselves uh, to be just absolutely perfect. And and that's not realistic whatsoever. So don't keep score and only work on a specific thing. That's if during your round, because you want to be able to sort of make it more tangible for you when you are playing uh, and you're not working on things to be able to separate like, hey, I'm keeping score now, so I'm not worrying about my form. Or hey, um, I'm still not keeping score, but I'm just here to have fun. I'm playing with some buddies. And so I'm not working on anything specifically. Now, the other thing is to, to get in the zone of where you're just enjoying the game. It is obviously if you go and do field work, you're there to work on something specific. So we want you to stay focused on that. I want you to stay focused on that. But when you're trying to separate the two, you have the practice during the round. But then you have the, the aspect that I just mentioned where it's like, hey, I'm just here to have fun. How do you get there? How do you get to where you're just having fun, you're not thinking about your form? Well, obviously you wanna take a breath and just throw. Now that sounds, um, honestly from my experience, that, that almost sounds more difficult than it really is. Uh, and the reason I say that is because just think about, hey, I'm just gonna throw this disc down the fairway. And when you simplify it to just something that's simple, like, hey, the goal is to throw it down this fairway, not think about how you're going to do it. Just think about this is what I am doing. And it kind of turns your brain off. Now, if that sort of thinking doesn't help, I still want you to take a deep breath. And then here's what I want you to do. There's a couple methods that I uh, have worked on myself and gotten feedback from other people about what works for them. The first thing that people will recommend and that I want to recommend to you, and you know, there are these methods here that we're going to go over. They may work for you. They may not. So if there's a method that I don't cover and there's only, let's see, uh, I got three methods that we're really going to go over. 
If there's something that I don't talk about that you found helpful, make sure you go ahead and leave it in the comments. That way you can help the rest of the community here. So the first thing is separate working on skills from rounds. So I talked about, you know, field work and having a, you know, just a practice round kind of thing. If you're having a hard time uh, avoiding like overstressing about your form during a round, stop working on your form during rounds. And now this, this is going to take some time because you're going to have to break the habit. But it's like, go do field work to work on your form and your skill and your distance. And then go play around for the sake of playing around and keeping score and having fun that way. And what that will do is that will help you start to mentally and physically separate those things. And then also come tournament time, it's going to be a lot easier because you've already started separating the fact that, hey... I'm playing around, I'm not thinking about my form, I'm not stressing about, you know, grip lock or, you know, early releasing or a nose up angle, I'm just going to be throwing. And that is huge, especially come tournaments, because it's, most people are going to shoot a little worse, especially in the AM division, shoot a little worse than they would, uh, shoot a little worse in playing a tournament than they would if it was just a casual round that day. Um, just that whole pressure of the moment and everything, but if you can get out of your head and just kind of be like, hey, I'm playing around and that's all I'm doing here, the, a great way to do that is to keep field work separate, keep those skills and that practice separate from the course. The other thing, and this is something <clears throat> that I've been doing a lot more for putting, for approach shots, for drives, is repeating a mantra or a phrase that helps you get in the zone. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be something, uh, you definitely don't want it to be something really long. Keep it nice and short. But it also doesn't have to be anything, you know, super deep and meaningful. It could just be instructions. Like, hey, you're lining up your putt and you're saying, hey, focus on the chain, hit the chain. Focus on the chain, hit the chain. And saying something like that will kind of get you mentally prepared for what you're about to do. When I'm throwing, some, something I say is, and it kind of varies a little bit, but it pretty much all revolves around this. And that is, don't worry about form, just throw, you got this. Some variations, sometimes, sometimes a little bit shorter, it may just be, don't think about the, don't think about it, just throw it. And that kind of, you know, harkens back to what I said as, uh, a little while ago, like, not thinking about how you're going to throw, but just actually throwing it. And that kind of just helps me kind of relax and trust my muscle memory that I've been developing at this point for me for three years. And that is something that I found to be super helpful. It's actually something that I learned from Matt. Uh, you guys have seen him on the channel before. Uh, especially when I've been in putting slumps with him, uh, I've been in putting slumps while playing around with him. That makes more sense. Uh, when I've been in putting slumps, sometimes I start to overthink all the little mechanics. And he's like, dude, stop thinking about all the mechanics. What are you trying to do? You're trying to put the disc in the basket. So just put the disc in the basket. Don't think about how you're going to do it. Just make the attempt to put it in the basket and not think about your form and all that. And it's sort of this disconnect that you have to make in your brain with your body that, hey, I've been shanking my putts, I've been shanking my throws, I'm not really executing right now. And it's really easy to sort of like escape inward and hyper focus on something where that's just going to make it worse. What you need to do is disconnect from the errors that you're making and just think about in its entirety, what are you trying to do? Trying to make that putt, trying to make that throw, just throw it. Just put it. Now, I, that may not help everybody, <laughs> but that has helped me probably more than anything else on this list. And then the last one, uh, and this is kind of hard for me, but I've been working on this as well. And that is to stay out of your head and basically don't think about anything. Basically just like wipe your brain clean and get into a zone. Now, I have found, like most athletes, this is easier to do when things are clicking. It is easier to not think about your putt when you're putting well. 
Same thing for when you're driving off the tee or your approach shots, things are just gelling, things are going really well, it's easy to not think about it. But it's also really helpful to not think about anything, not even about like what you're attempting to do to just have like an absolute empty thought. Because it just like your body will just relax. It's not tensed about anything. And that's the worst way to play disc golf feeling tensed about stuff. And so those three things separate working on skills from rounds. So basically field work is for working on stuff. Rounds are for just playing. That's the first thing. The second, repeat a mantra or a phrase to kind of help you get in the mindset. And then the third is to not think about anything whatsoever. So I hope you found those tips super helpful. I know I have found them helpful. I've been working on them, implementing them into my game, and I'm really excited for this summer to just continue working on these and seeing you know, just what I can achieve this summer by starting to separate form practice from the course. And so I'm really excited about that. If there is anything that you need help with on your backhand, your forehand, your putt, I can coach you on GiveGo and help you out with that. So if you're interested in getting some one-on-one individualized coaching, just send me a video on GiveGo and you can send your first video for free using code Regiro. Um, Send that video to me. I'll respond to you with a video, with some annotations, some voiceover, and basically just help you improve your game. So that's on GiveGo, currently only available on iOS, but... I hope I, I hope I can see you there and I can't wait to help you with disc golf. All right, so a couple weeks ago, OTB sent me a stack of discs. Thank you so much. So this section of the show is always sponsored by OTB, but especially because they sent me a really cool disc. So with OTB, I've been on their team now uh, for I think November or no, October will be three years. So if you go ahead and use discount code GladiatorDG at otbdiscs.com, you'll get free shipping. So you can get some sweet OTB open discs like this. Um, so today we are reviewing the MVP Tesla. Now, the sticker must have fallen off or I took it off, but I'm fairly certain that this was 158 grams. So I was like, Ooh, this thing's going to be nice and flippy. Super excited about that. The Tesla, this one in particular, not as flippy as I was expecting. You see, a Tesla's flight numbers are 9 speed, 5 glide, minus 1 turn, and 2 fade. So it's basically like a Pro Thunderbird, uh, an old uh, Discmania CD2. Um Basically, along those lines, a beaten Thunderbird, if you have it in Star or Champion Plastic, it's kind of what the Tesla is supposed to fly like. Now, I've been pretty vocal, at least recently, that I don't throw a lot of fast discs. Like, 9-speed discs, 10-speed discs are kind of the top of my bag. I don't have any genuine distance drivers in my bag. No 11 or 12 speeds right now. And that's normally how I run my bag. I I like the 7 to nine speeds and mainly the seven, maybe an eight speed. Uh, right now a jackalope is technically an eight speed, so I'm running with those. Um, but I don't normally need anything faster than that. I just like the amount of control for distance that I get with those slower speeds. So this is nearing the faster, faster world, although still within range. But anyway, the Tesla nine speed, It's really nice and flat. It feels super comfortable for backhand and forehand. Um, It's got a little bit of a straighter flight for me with the forehand than it did for the backhand. And that's kind of what I was alluding to with the lighter weight. I was expecting this to be a lot flippier. And it wasn't as flippy as I was expecting. Now, it could have just been a bad day. I only got one day to really work on it, um, to really work with it. And I wasn't really jiving, you know, thing, it was, it was hot. I was rushing, trying to kind of figure this disc out and I just wasn't getting a lot of good throws with it. So I want to give it another shot in the future, but basically I was not expecting this disc to fly the way it did. It flew more overstable than I was expecting. I was expecting it to really hyzer flip. Um, for those with faster arms, it probably will hyzer flip right out of the box for you. But for me, just with a bad day and not really messing around with a ton of nine speed discs, it just wasn't all that great for me. But 
one of the things that I noticed is that because it wasn't um, it wasn't like a worthless overstability. It was a workable stability, which means as as you would continue beating this disc in, it's going to beat up. It'll take some time because I think MVP tends to uh, take a little while to really beat in. You be able to have a nice workable driver and start to layer. And I love layering discs. And that would be really good for this. Now, like I said, this feels comfortable for, for both backhand and forehand. And so I was able to get some pretty decent throws both ways, depending on the win, anywhere between, you know, uh, 250 and 300, just kind of messing with a couple things, throwing some different angles, but not really getting anything good with it. I, I never got a really good clean release with it, uh, which is unfortunate because it's a really pretty disc and I really wanted to throw it. But I'll have to go and try it again and just kind of see if maybe on a better day I can kind of figure it out. But I will say that is not the first. This is not the first time I've thrown a Tesla. I've thrown some other Teslas years ago, and I was really excited about them because this was before like everybody was making the big jump to gyro, sort of speak. Like it was obviously a thing when James Conrad went there like two or three years ago. But like right before he went there or shortly after he went there and people were still figuring some things out, I was trying some Teslas that I had traded for and they were also more overstable than I was expecting. And so I, I don't know if it's just me, but I haven't had good experience with the Tesla before. Uh, and so that's why I've never been able to fall in love with it. I like the idea of it having minus one turn two fade. I love its workability. I love that it feels great for backhand and forehand, but I have never been able to throw it well and to get like good consistent flight out of it. And so because of that, I've never bagged it for long term, never really played with it much. In my opinion, there are better drivers in this class, that nine speed neutral to overstable class. Um, there are better drivers out there that you can throw. But that's not to say that it's a bad disc, just doesn't work super well for me. So that is the Tesla. If you wanna try this out or you wanna get another MVP disc with this really cool stamp, the OTB Open Stamp, uh, go ahead and head to otbdiscs.com and use discount code GladiatorDG. Now, if you are on the East Coast, you may wanna try something different. You may wanna try otbeast.com. I know. So like, what is this website? OTB opened a partner store on the East Coast of the United States. And so basically what that means is that if you order from otbeast.com and you live on the East Coast, not only did OTB already get you your discs faster, but now you'll be able to get them even faster. Now I will say selection is smaller on otbeast.com than otb.com but it is getting there. I check it a couple times a week and I'm always seeing new discs added to that website. So if you're on the East Coast and you wanna try out an MVP disc or another disc from OTB and you're on that East Coast area, check out otbeast.com and the discount code should work there as well. But that is all we have for the disc review. Now let's go ahead and let's talk about a couple interesting current events in the disc golf world. So for the last month, Kristen Tatar has been out. She's been back in Estonia, chilling out, Max, and relaxing, all cool. I don't think she plays a lot of basketball outside the school there, but she's been chilling in Estonia, uh, hanging out with Silver, hanging out with her daughter. Super happy for her. Getting that time home is super important, especially when you're on your on the road as much as she is and internationally. But she came back, and she dominated. <laughs> she played really really well Kristen Tatar is back sorry I don't do I uh don't hold anything for spoilers here she won the Portland Open in pretty dominating fashion yes there were moments in the final round where things seemed like ooh, they're getting a little close but never close enough to actually say oh she's at risk of losing this tournament that never happened so Kristen Tatar is back, super happy to have her back on tour, and it's just really funny to me. I saw some people commenting this, and I thought, you know, it was a really, uh, it was just funny. 
basically it was like when Kristen was gone, we had all these other women winning the FPO tournaments. And now that she's back, it's like, okay, she's back to winning now. <laughs> and it's just very interesting. Uh, she, it's, it's crazy to me. It's wild. I shouldn't say crazy. It's just wild how um, her game has elevated so much over the last couple of years and just how much better she is right now than everybody else in the field. Uh, just and, and the big thing I say with that is like, she obviously hasn't won every single tournament she's played in, but her consistency is almost always there. 99% of the rounds she's played in this year, she's been on form. And so that is just really, really cool. It's going to be, you know, something really special to look back on this year, especially if she wins Worlds again, which honestly, she is the betting favorite. I mean, there's no reason why you wouldn't at least pick her to be one of the top three finishers at Worlds. But she is back playing super great. Can't wait to see uh, what the next couple of weeks look like for her and how many more victories. I, I really, I don't know if somebody has asked her this, but I really want to know how she gets all her trophies home. <laughs> Especially some of them that are like, absolutely massive or bona fide weapons like uh, she didn't play this tournament but um beaver state fling i think was the one with with the axe like if an international player won like how would they get that axe home like i don't genuinely know uh and so if you know you know please tell me obviously like yeah you can ship it but i just wonder what that would actually look like like how much would that actually cost to mail those trophies to your home uh, over international waters. So that's all I wanted to say about that. There's a couple other things regarding Portland Open that we'll get to in a little bit. But if you were on Instagram, you may have noticed last week, the end of last week, that Disc Golf Bra, if you follow them, was posting a couple things about hot stamping and, hey, PDGA, is this legal? Is this illegal? And kind of calling them out on some stuff. And I knew I was a little confused. I'm like, what is going on? Well, I reached out to Disc Golf Bra and they were gracious enough to share kind of a little bit of information, some background information. And they also shared the link on Reddit where this kind of all happened. So there was somebody who reached out to PDGA, basically um, asking them, about like, hey, are these hot stamps that these retailers are adding to discs legal? Like, what exactly is the ruling on all of this? And here's what uh, Mike Krupika, PJ number 28238, um, replied with, post-production changes to a disc are limited. You can use an ink or dye which absorbs into the plastic to add your identification or other graphics to the disc. You may not use any techniques which changes the thickness of the plastic at any point or adds a material to the surface of the disc. Hot stamping done by someone other than the manufacturer would be adding a material of detectable thickness. Okay, so that sounds pretty straightforward. But... When you actually look on the PDGA website, things that would make it illegal, you have modifying the disc, excessively sanding, etching, carving, or engraving, and then adding a material of a detectable thickness such as paint or glow tape. You know, they don't have that there, but like that's why glow rounds are not PDGA sanctioned. It's adding detectable thickness. The issue that I think Disc Golf Bra and some others are having with this ruling is that this detectable thickness, this hot stamp that they're adding is literally the same process that the manufacturers are putting. And so if it's exactly the same kind of process, the same kind of stamp, it's not really a detectable thickness. I mean, a stamp is so fine. You can feel it, you know, if you run your finger over it for sure. But I mean, it is so, 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 so thin. And on the PGA website, they only specified something such as paint, okay? Dyeing the disc is okay. Obviously, putting a stamp on the disc, if you're the, uh, the like, an Infinite Discs or an Innova, you know, manufacturer. I know there are some uh, disc manufacturers out there that don't actually manufacture their disc, but they are the brand for the disc that they don't, that they can still do their hot stamps or whatever, and that's totally fine. But someone like OTB, um, 
individual players, uh, Disc Golf Bra in this case, and other brands where they'll like take stock discs or they'll just take any disc and they'll put one of their hot stamps on top of that or next to it. That is kind of, that is what this person on, on Reddit Mike uh, was responding with, basically saying that is illegal. And the issue that I have with that is not so much that they're trying to draw a line in the sand with like what's legal and what's illegal is that it's no different than what these retail uh, than what these manufacturers are already doing. It's not like you have these retailers painting a disc and selling it at a markup and hey, it's still PJ legal. Like, no, it's very clearly not because there's paint on it. So I was just talking with Disc Golf Bra about that and I really appreciate um, their their prompt responses. You know, one of the things that I asked them, basically what I've asked is like, we've seen companies do this for years, but it sounds like someone reported you or reached out to you. Did the PGA penalize you? How did this all come about? And uh, they said that nobody reported us or reached out to us, but there was this post on Reddit that I read to you guys where basically uh, what companies do is legal and they had a board member say anyone who stamps that's not a manufacturer is illegal, but that's very broad. It's never been illegal according to PGA rule book, rule book. So they're just trying to stick up for small businesses that do that kind of stuff, the, the, this hot stamping that is okay. And I think that is definitely... Um, respectable, like there's there's nothing wrong with that. And of all things for the PDGA to be worried about, I don't think this is anything worth worrying about. Like if someone goes and puts a hot stamp on and they do it the right way, it's not even a gram, okay? And technically there are weighted discs out there that are illegal, but nobody's at tournaments weighing them. And there's foot faults happening. And, you know, I, I was reading through. So these are not my original ideas. I was reading through the Reddit thread and people were just saying like, there are foot, foot faults that don't get called. There are overweight discs that don't get weighed and the people are allowed to throw them. Why are we going to worry about stamps? Nobody's going to be calling about, oh, you have an OTB or a disc golf bra or an extra stamp on there. That's an illegal disc. You can't throw that. No one's going to worry about that because so many players have discs like that. And also... If they're unsure, there's no way for them to track whether or not it was an original stamp or if it was a hot stamp. So just unnecessary complications with all of that. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about that, go ahead and head to Disc Golf Bra's Instagram channel. They have a couple uh, funny reels about all this and they're super responsive. And so if you want to get more information about it, you can go ahead and ask them. I will also put some of the links in the description below about some of the stuff that I referenced here. But I just wanted to share that occurrence with you guys. I thought it was really interesting. I had never thought about it because I had never seen an issue with it. But apparently there is an issue with it for some people. I just don't think it should be. Now, something that is an issue and does need to be addressed, although I don't know the answer, is baskets. Now, I'll say this. There are some baskets out there that are just not good. Then there are some baskets that are really good. There are some putts that are really good and they stay in the basket. And then there are some putts that should be really good and they just don't stay in the basket. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, I'm, there were uh, several spit outs on coverage for the, uh, for the Portland Open. But probably the most infamous spit out is hole 16 of the final round, Aaron Gossage to take what would eventually be the lead to give him the victory. He goes and takes about, I think it was like a 15 foot putt, 12 foot putt, puts it at the basket, dead center. I mean, Goose has struggled in previous tournaments with missing low, yanking it, not this putt. This putt was perfect. It was dead center in the heart of the chains. It hit dead center and started going down and he felt it was in that he started bending down to pick up his mini. And sure enough, the disc bounced back, bounces back, hits off the cage and falls out of the basket. I don't know that 
a physicist could look at this and try and figure out why. Now, yes, there is a thing of like, how much paste do you have in your putt? But I gotta be honest with that. Like, I don't know how much paste really messes up a putt. Because there are times where it's like, I'll doink a putt and I'll pick it up and I'll just whip it at the basket. And you know what's never happened when I've done that from two feet away? It's never hit pull and bounce back. So I don't know the physics of why a disc will go into the chains and not settle down. I can't explain why it doesn't happen, why, why it happens. But even more so, I can't explain how this happened. How did Goose's putt hit perfect? He could have literally done that putt another 10 times, and I guarantee all 10 of them would have stayed in. So it's really unfortunate that for some reason that putt did not stay in. It's like the, the disc golf gods were just not going to let it fall. It was good. They were going to force a playoff. And it's really unfortunate because Goose has been in the running for multiple titles, starting with Worlds last year and then multiple Elite Series this year. Um, to be able to get that first big win like that. And it just hasn't happened yet. I definitely think it's coming. Uh, he's just really earning his stripes right now. But in regard to just baskets in general, because we have to think outside of freak accidents. That's basically what that was. It was just a freak accident that was really no accident on Goose's part. Was it a, an accident of the basket? I don't know. Like there are baskets out there where they heavily reward center putts. And if you miss just even a little left or right, a lot, especially with some of the mock baskets, like mock threes, I think are specifically like the ones where it's really tight chains in the center. So if you hit the center, you're golden. But if you miss, if you uh, hit left or right, there's a good chance of spitting out. So you have some of those baskets that can be a little wishy washy. Then you have other baskets like uh, Innova's Disc Catcher, which I think is pretty much all around the preferred basket. It just catches a lot of different putts really well. Um, so it's just really unfortunate. I don't think that the solution, well, this is really hard because it's one of those things where like we've talked about with course design and wooded course versus an open course, like the PDGA has rules about basically which baskets are approved for the tour. You have the Prodigy basket, the disc catcher. Um, I think you have uh, the dynamic disc veteran, which is I think what these baskets were this past weekend. And there may be the MVP basket as well. I can't recall off the top of my head, but you have three or four approved baskets for the pros. Something that I've always wondered about was why not just have one or or have the PDGA basically make a basket for the PDGA, so to speak, or the Disc Golf Pro Tour do it for the Disc Golf Pro Tour, and they just transport those 18 baskets. That is probably a lot of work, which is why it isn't done. It's a lot easier to just, hey, we're gonna go to the course and whatever baskets are there, we'll play on those kind of thing. But I'm, you know, on one side of the argument, I'm like, it's cool to have different manufacturers making the baskets because it's also a promotional thing and that helps them make money. But then it's also like, okay, would it also, would it be better though for everyone to always put on the same baskets week in and week out? And I definitely think there's some validity to that. I just don't know how feasible and plausible it is to actually put it into practice. But I just wanted to kind of share that. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to come up with the answer. I don't even have a clear answer. But it was just something that we all saw this past weekend. And it definitely needed to be talked about. So I want to know what your thoughts are. Go ahead and share them in the comments. Uh, I'm really interested what you think about the baskets. Yes, what happened to Aaron Gossage was just wild to happen like that is unfortunate we've all had some really weird spit outs that we could never replicate and i think this is one of them and it's unfortunate of the timing 
but it happened and that's the way it is. Uh, but is there something that can be done to possibly prevent some of those things? Not really sure about that either. So I think there's just going to be a lot. I think there can be a lot of discussion about materials used and that kind of thing. You know, maybe instead of using metal chains, you could use a softer material that might catch them a little bit better. Don't know. Don't know how all that would affect and change things. But anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. I really want to hear what you have to uh, say about that and what you think. And at this point, if you're still listening, thank you so much for the support. I really appreciate all of you who are listening, the, the viewership on YouTube, the listenership on Spotify and Apple is just growing every single week. And it's all because of you. Thank you so, so much. It would mean the world to me if you would rate the, uh, if you're on Spotify or Apple, go ahead and leave a rating and a review to share with other disc golfers so that when they come across Teach Play Disc Golf, they realize, hey, I need to be listening to this podcast. And if you're on YouTube, please go ahead and like and subscribe and leave a comment about any of the things that we're talking about in this episode. It would mean a lot to me. And with the algorithm and everything, it shares it with other disc golfers out there who are looking for some really awesome content. So thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. Now let's go ahead and let's wrap up this episode recapping the Portland Open and previewing the Zoo Town Open. So quick tournament recap. Kristen Tatara played really well. She had a slow final round, but it obviously worked out for her because she won. And we've already talked about Kristen earlier in the episode, so I want to spend the rest of this time uh, talking about the FPO division, talking about Sayananda and Juliana Korber. Sayananda, in my opinion, has really taken FPO by storm, really making a name for herself this year, and cement. And I, and I believe she's beginning to cement herself as a force in the FPO division. Uh, she's only won one or two events this year, but still, that is that is really good for somebody that was not in the winner's circle last year. She's really cleaned up and improved her game. She does not really have a forehand, but she has a great backhand turnover, and she controls her angles so, so well. So I'm really excited to continue watching her play this year. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Hopefully she gets a couple more victories. She's definitely becoming a fan favorite. Now, one of the greats in disc golf, regardless of division, Juliana Korver, five-time world champ. It was so good to see her play well. And it sounds like she was having a lot of intimidation and, and trepidation about being on tour, especially this year with some of the, the way that these women are playing so well out there. But she showed why she is so good and was so good many years ago when she was winning all her titles in the 90s. Her game is consistent. She's smooth. She is a very well-rounded Frisbee player. Uh, ultimate disc golf. Um, oh, great. Now, uh, now I'm going blank. But the other Frisbee sports that are out there, uh, freestyle. She is super comfortable Um playing frisbee and so she has great control of her discs she knows exactly what they're going to do every time she throws them and it was just so great seeing her perform and play so well you know especially on a course like this where it was really long juliana admittedly does not have a ton of power i mean it wasn't up until probably about three years ago that fpo you really needed power to win and women like Juliana Korver and Own Scoggins are showing like, hey, you can still compete though if you don't have 400 foot plus power. And neither of those women do, but Juliana can still throw a solid 350, 375, maybe even hit 390. Um, so she's not, you know, a bad distance player. She just isn't ripping it 500 feet like some of these women are. But nonetheless, she played so well. It was great watching her play. Um, really good person, good personality, good soul. And so I hope that this kind of maybe rekindled the competitive fire within her like, hey, I can play here. She only lost, I think, by four strokes. And so it's just crazy to think that she is, she was right there all weekend, really being able to uh, compete and, and all that kind of stuff. So 
pulling up scores here as we're going to get ready to wrap up FPO. But really, really happy for her and Sayananda and the great weekend. We had a really good weekend of golf. Um, it was just a lot of fun watching FPO. And I just cannot wait to see what happens. So in the FPO division, we had first place. Okay, she didn't lose by four strokes. It ended up being six. But in first place, we had Kristen Tatar at minus 25, Sayananda in second at minus 21, Owen Scoggin and Juliana Corver tied for third at minus 19, Paige Pierce, Missy Gannon tied for fifth at minus 13. So 12 strokes from the lead was fifth place. Uh, th I noticed this weekend, you know, I feel like FPO has been a lot closer in the top 10 strokes wise. But this weekend, the spread was very different. And that's because this course was challenging. Uh, it was a long course. It was a difficult course. Tied for seventh, we had Emily Beach and Ella Hansen at minus nine. Ninth place, we had Katrina Allen at minus eight. And then tied for 10th, Rebecca Cox, Rachel Turton, and Jessica Weiss tied uh, at minus seven for 10th place. Uh, speaking of, Rebecca Cox on the mic on Jomez Pro with uh, Erica Stinchcomb, really, really cool. Great player, great FPO player. Glad to hear her on the mic. Now, MPO was a little bit of a different story. We definitely had a lot of players in the mix. We had Corey Ellis. We had Isaac Robinson. We had James Proctor, Adam Hammes, Aaron Gossage. And at one point, I think Alden Harris was even in the running a little bit too. So there were a lot of players who were at one time or another tied for the lead or very, very close to the lead. And so MPO was super competitive. But by the end of the round, it really came down to three players. Corey Ellis, Isaac Robinson, and Adam Hammes. And they were all on lead cards. So if you were watching post-produce like I was, you were able to see them. And... A couple mishaps here and there on Corey Ellis's part that he kind of ended up a stroke back and couldn't quite regain it. Then you had Aaron Gossage with that nasty spit out on hole 16. And then Adam Hammes basically taking a par or par or bogey. What did he take? Uh, taking the bogey on hole 17 when Aaron Gossage went and took a birdie. So that two stroke swing actually ended up you know putting uh gossage in the lead and then hole 18 at this point Corey was needing a miracle to happen to kind of gain those one or two strokes but gossage took a par and adam took a birdie so we went to a one hole playoff and there adam hammis was able to get the victory uh gossage uh, i'm trying to remember now i think was just uh a little low on the putt, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so unfortunate that he actually lost the lead or lost the tie for the lead with that missed putt on 16, regained the lead on 17, and then lost the lead on 18, and then lost the tournament in the one hole playoff. Uh, but really, really fun to watch. Um, it was great coverage of that it was just really exciting i really enjoyed it now the estonia open was happening at the same time and in last week's episode we talked about paul playing in that and i'm still watching the coverage and i'll put the round one uh coverage links in the description that way if you haven't seen it you can watch it so i don't have much to say on that but i will say we know paul Macbeth does not win he actually doesn't even finish in the top 10 which is really, really crazy. But some more thoughts on that in a future episode, maybe once we see a little bit more how the European tour plays out and more players get there. But that, uh, let's go through the um, MPO. We had Adam Hammes win in first place at minus 30. Aaron Gossage in second place, also minus 30, but that's because they went to the one-hole playoff. Corey Ellis, minus 29 in third. Fourth place, Isaac Robinson, minus 28. Tied for fifth. James Proctor and Alden Harris at minus 25. Tied for 7th, Calvin Heimberg and Ezra Aderhold at minus 24. Tied for ninth, Ricky Wysocki and Gannon Burr at minus 22. So 8 strokes separating 1st and 10th place, or in this case, ninth place. So a lot of exciting things 
Really enjoy this past weekend of disc golf, and I am so looking forward to this upcoming weekend of disc golf. That's right, the Zoo Town Open is this weekend. Some of you might be saying, what is this tournament? Never heard of it, not familiar. There is coverage of pros playing it years past uh, on YouTube, but I actually have a personal connection with Zoo Town. Matt, I've already mentioned in this episode, went and played Zoo Town for about three years in a row with some friends who lived in Washington State, and they would drive over to Missoula, Montana to play the Zoo Town Open back when it was just an A tier. And actually, Zoo Town is where Matt had his first thousand rated rounds when he was putting with the Castaplas Ricos or Recos. Um, and so that is really, really cool. So I have that connection there. I was making plans at one point, like kind of just in conversation, not actually looking, but making plans to go play there as well. It just never ended up happening, especially now that it's on the pro tour. I would not be able to play unless they had an AM weekend, which would be really cool. But Zoo Town is a mountain course. It'll be really fun. There's going to be elevation. It's probably going to be pretty toasty, but we shall see. I am super excited for the coverage here. I think it's going to be great. This is a silver series. So um, we're probably not going to have all of the top players because we also have a couple European uh, Pro Tour events. But for the Zoo Town Open, we'll go ahead and make our Grip 6 pick. Ooh, oh yes, let's go. We have so many top tier players at Zoo Town. I am super excited. Um, oh man, who do we want to pick for our Grip 6? You know, James Conrad has been playing really, really well. So I'm going to go with James Conrad. This is... A fairly weird course, if I'm remembering correctly, and if the layout will still be the same. So I think hitting lines and controlling those angles is going to be super important. So I think Mason Ford will be great. And then, is he playing? Where is he? Is he playing? I don't know that Aaron Gossage is playing. I don't see his name here. I realized like, hey, he's constantly up there. Oh, I know who I was going to take. I wasn't going to take Aaron Gossage. I was going to take James Proctor. Is he here? Oh, man, I don't see his name. I don't think James Proctor is playing. Man, that's a bummer. I was getting real. I was getting ready to choose to choose him. Um, but that's unfortunate. Doesn't look like he's playing it. Okay, so we got. James Conrad, Mason Ford, and we will go with, let's go with a little bit of a dark horse here and not who you're thinking. We're going to go with Nicola Castro. We'll see how he performs. On the FPO side, yes, we are going to go Kristen Tatar. We're going to, I'm going to pick Valerie Mandahano. She's one of my favorite FPO players and she is back on tour. Her big elite series will be DDO next weekend. Uh, but she's here playing the Masula Open. And then I will also pick Sai Ananda. Super excited. So we got Conrad, Ford, LaCastro, Tatar, Mandahano, and Sai Ananda. I am super excited for these picks. We're just going to put a number in there. Probably not going to get anywhere close anyway. But guys, that is all I have for you for episode 15. I had a lot of fun talking with you about all this. And as we do on every episode before we sign off, I want to encourage you to go ahead and teach someone disc golf this weekend. Encourage them, send them a message, teach someone new in person, but go out there and teach someone how to play disc golf and make sure that you go out and play some disc golf as well this weekend. It's been a lot of fun playing and just improving my game this year. And I hope you've been enjoying the same benefits. That is all I have for you today. Until next time, everyone, have a great round. Mm -hmm.